Howdy. Well, we're here again. And no, I don't know anything about economics. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here to try to move this along and get us started in the right direction, and we'll, we'll see what's going on. Uh, it is an interesting thing to see it, this many people. I, I'm not sure. It's really hard to make eye contact that far away. <laughs> I got I to gotta tell you. So just, yeah, okay. give me a break up here. Um, basically, the good news. Everybody's been concerned about recession. Recession this year, we're going to have a recession, not going to have a recession. Uh, the headlines, if you watch any of the, uh, the news shows and the business uh, TV shows, all the talking heads are there. And we're going to do this, we're not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to give you the answer. And then I'm going to sit down and quit while I'm ahead. Now, the, the, the odds are way against it. Uh, although I have to tell you that uh, Vegas has increased the odds about 12 percentage points from about 17 to 29 percent of a recession this year. But that still means it's, a, it's a two to one against. So, yeah, not likely. In fact, <clears throat> most of the things that would probably come into play that might cause a recession would take several months to, to have the full impact and, and for us to feel it. So the answer is, and you can take it home, uh, Gaines said there was probably not going to be a recession. Now, that was the kiss of death. <laughs> okay, that was the absolute kiss of death. I should have just predicted the recession, and then we wouldn't have one. Uh, but we'll we'll have to see how it goes. Eighteen uh, at the national level. Excuse me. With the with the, I've been fighting cold for the last two weeks, so just bear with me a little bit. Uh, Twenty eighteen, good year. Everything went fine, uh, pretty much. Uh, real GDP growth at the U.S. level, in fact, was the best that it's been in the last seven years. We've had this recovery. I, I believe it is next month sets the record for the longest continual economic expansion uh, that we've had, that we've ever measured. It, it'll beat the 120 months of the 1990s. Uh, so uh, everybody will, will have celebratory uh, uh, parties all over the state and all over the country uh, to celebrate hitting the 121st month of, of continued economic expansion. The, the, the difference is that this one has been so, so modest in terms of increase each year. It's been extremely modest, to be, be precise, and which may not be a bad thing. Uh, it, it's sort of taking the, the ups and downs out and, and keeping things at an even keel, which is what policymakers uh, and, and those who affect the economy generally try to do is make it go at an even keel. And so far, they've been able to pull it off even despite themselves and whatever else they're doing. So we'll, we'll have to see. But it's probably going to slow down 2.9% last year on GDP, probably be around 2.4, and a, two four, somewhere in that vicinity, maybe even as low as 2.2. Two. Uh, might get lucky and get 2.5. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, the, the, the economy shifted, if you're not aware of it, during the last six months uh, pretty good. Uh, interest rates and a whole bunch of other stuff, so it's doing better. Jobs are still going up. Unemployment rate is still less than 4%. Uh, for those of you with my color hair, when we were in college and, and taking economics, they taught us that full employment was 6% or 7% unemployment rate. That was, that was nirvana, if you could get to there. 4% was simply unheard of, and anything less than 4% uh, meant that we must be shooting people or something. Uh, <laughs> And the interesting thing, though, we've got this really tight labor market. We've got, according to the official numbers, something like 7.1 million jobs available. And officially, we only have 6.8 million people unemployed. Now, that's a hell of a note, isn't it? Now, of course, you have to understand how the U.S. government counts unemployed people. To be counted as being unemployed, you have to not be working, but you have to be actively looking for work. If you're not working, but you're sitting home drinking beer and having fun, you don't count as being unemployed. So if you add those folks in, it's up over about eight, eight and a half million people. So it's, it's really that. Uh, interest rates went up and down. The Fed, of course, was uh, threatening to do more interest rate increases this year. This was back about six months ago or seven months ago. Uh, now they have more or less admitted uh, uh, 
uh, officially that they're not going to do much of anything this year. And as I was talking to some other folks, and, and if you read the, what's going on around the world and, and, and around the country, there isn't even a, a possibility that they might even consider a rate cut here if we don't get inflation and rate of growth. Because generally, you don't raise rates unless the economy is really booming, and you raise the rates to kind of slow it down and even it out. Well, if the economy isn't really going and booming, then you start cutting rates to make it better. So it's, it's one of those kind of things. I, my personal opinion is I don't think they're going to do anything. Uh, first of all, I don't think they have any idea what to do. But, but that's, a, that's a sidebar. Uh, but, but I think what, what they have done is they have found a more or less neutral level of rate uh, for the Fed funds rate and for rates in general. In other words, it's not accommodative and it's not repressive. It's just sort of neutral. It's not doing much of anything. And so the monetary policy is staying uh, in place. We'll, we'll have to see. I've got a thing on interest rates I'll show you in a minute. I, it's in the kind of, you know it's charts and graphs are coming. Okay. You, you can't avoid it. I'm sorry. It doesn't, it doesn't. Inflation. Uh, at the end of last year, we were actually approaching about 2.5% inflation. That was the reason the Fed was bumping those rates there uh, in the second half of the year last year. But that's gone away. It, it, it's come back down. It's now less than 2% again. So we'll have to see. Tax cuts, all the tax cuts last year did help a little bit. Of course, we discovered <coughs> a couple of weeks ago that it wasn't as good as we thought. Uh, corporate America was helped a good bit, much more than individuals. But the anticipated reinvestment of the savings, the tax savings by corporate America hasn't really come into play as much as what was anticipated or, or targeted. Uh, uh, corporate America, if they, if they save money, and yes, corporate earnings were up and after tax corporate earnings were up because the tax rate went down on them. But what they wound up doing was instead of reinvesting into their company and expanding and expanding job opportunities and so on, they reduced debt and bought back their stock. So, so there, was a, there was that kind of reinvestment, but not the expans, expansion type. Industrial production's going fine. Uh, it's, all of these things are slowing down the last three months. They're all still positive, and that's, that's the hard part to get across here. Nothing is going off the cliff. It's just slowing down uh, the pace of it. Income and spending is, is up, are both up. Housing, the housing market has been weird. The housing market officially has not actually recovered from the Great Recession of 07-08. Uh, read new construction, new home construction. Single family construction, even total housing construction, is still running somewhere around about 80, 85% of pre-recession levels. It isn't there. And, and that's a biggie, because historically, ever since at least World War II, all of the, all of the cycles that we've had, housing market has generally been leading going in, but also leading coming out and bringing the rest of the economy up with it. That hasn't happened. That's one reason we've had this mediocre uh, rate of uh, economic expansion is because a lot of it is because the housing market has not contributed as much as historically it has after a downturn. So we'll have to see. It's still going. And if, if you're not familiar with it, and I, I'm pretty sure Detlef will probably talk a little bit more about this than because he knows a whole lot more about it than I do. But the U.S. Uh, last year became the number one oil producer in the world. We now produce more oil. I'll we, take credit. It was yeah, he'll, he's going to take credit for it here in just a minute. But, but, but we're, we, we beat the, the, the Russians. Take that, commies. <laughs> Beat Saudi Arabia, uh, and and is there all of you? And we've told you this in the last two or three times we've been together that you know ever since uh, uh, late 2014 on Thanksgiving when when uh, Saudi Arabia announced they weren't going to support prices and it started the the price decline in 14, 15, and come back up. That ever since then the U.S. fracking industry has become the 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 producer. Uh, of, of, of note in the world on the global energy scene, and that that is uh, uh, held true. The other the other important part of that is we've become a net exporter of uh, petroleum based products, not oil per se, but all of the uh, 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 distillates and all of the production and and plastics and and all of the stuff that comes out of the downstream 
uh, energy industry, and we are now net exporters. That's important for Texas. That's important for the Texas land markets because Texas is the number one exporting state in the union by dollar. Exporting is extremely important uh, to our country, to our state, and to our state's economy. So, and of course, a lot of that is going through the Gulf uh, ports uh, from uh, Port Arthur, Beaumont, all the way down to Brownsville and all along uh, the coast there in the Galveston, Houston, and Freeport, and so on. So that's, those, those are, you know, some, some things going on. Okay, some charts and graphs. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Consumer confidence, 70% of our economy, plus or minus, is based on, our, on all of us achieving our patriotic duty and going out and spending 110% of what we make. And, and, and that we, so we watch things like consumer confidence intervals and just do people, are, do you feel good? If you feel good and confident about things, the economy, your life, the, the world in general, whatever, uh, you spend money. And if you spend money, then the economy thrives. And, and if you don't, if, you, if it comes down and you're depressed, and don't feel good about it. I mean, it's really simple. This is this is high. This is economic 601. Uh, you have to take college course in this to figure this out, right? Uh, but it, but people just don't spend. And and free market capitalism systems are based on people spending money. Now, people includes uh, uh, corporate America businesses and government. So it's spending collectively. What this is focused on just personal consumption, which is people. Uh, and, and my wife is one of the most pe patriotic people you've ever met. <laughs> and she's not here, so I can say that. But Texas, you can see, we've been, uh, been, been uh, very optimistic. The little downturn there on the end, that was uh, here at the fourth quarter last year because uh, it lags behind a little bit when the price of oil went down uh, back in November and December. And so it, it affected. It's coming back up. Small business. Uh, this is this is Main Street America. This is six, uh, two thirds of the jobs. Uh, small businesses. Uh, the small businesses are are interesting phenomena. If you get into looking at them, one of the things that we're beginning to pay more and more attention to is the slowdown in the rate of creation of new small businesses. The entrepreneurism uh, in America and throughout the world is beginning to, to taper down, and that's generally not a good sign. Uh, there are always a number of reasons why these things happen, not the least of which are political and policy reasons that make it more and more difficult to, to go out and create a business. Uh, many of you are small businessmen, own your own companies and so forth, and it's becoming harder. But nevertheless, the small business optimism index has been dropping a little bit. Can you see the big jump there where it went above 100? That was November 10th, 2016. Does that ring a bell? That was when that big jump happened. And the interesting thing was it went up and became far more optimistic. It, uh, small businesses became far more optimistic after the election. And it more or less has stayed there until here fairly recently when it's been coming down. That some of that was the tax cut wasn't as good as they thought it was going to be. Some of it was simply because the pace of business activity wasn't as strong uh, as, as people thought that it was going to be. And some of it was just, it was, it was unbridled optimism based on nothing but just, you know, what I think. And, and that sort of, ge that generally tends to ebb and flow uh, anyway, so it goes like that. Let me talk a, lot, a little bit about interest rates. Uh, the, the green line across the bottom there is the federal funds rate. That's that rate you hear about every six weeks or so when the Federal Open Market Committee meets and is the rate that they target. It's the overnight bank lending rate. You can't really borrow money at that rate, uh, but it's, it's, the, it's the shortest term rate. It's 24-hour uh, rate for money, okay? Uh, and, and the interesting thing, you can see the stair step uh, movement uh, on the on the curve, as it was about every other meeting for the last year and a half, they were bumping it at a quarter of a point and going on up. It stands now the upper limit of the range they're looking for is at two and a half. The effective rate is a little less, about two three five. Uh, so so it's right in that area. And what you'll see is it's almost identical to the ten year Treasury rate. So it's real unusual 
It's not, it's not impossible, and you can see back over to the far left, it's happened before, for the short-term rate to be higher than the long-term rate. Now, generally, when that happens, and it's an inverted yield curve is the technical term for that, and it, it's at different rates. It might be the six-month higher than the one-year, or the one-year higher than the five-year, and so forth. There are different combinations of short-term rates versus long-term rates one might look at. If that persists over time, it's generally been a pretty good leading indicator you're going to get a recession because the, re the economy shouldn't be that way. Just common sense tells you short-term rates should be lower than long-term rates. It, there's nothing magical or, or real fancy about that. There's no economic theory other than the time cost of money uh, that, 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 that tells you that. But we've had those episodes here the last six months or so where for short periods of time, a day, a two-day period, we've had some of the short-term rates higher than the long-term rates. And that has been concerned in the financial markets. Uh, the, the, the lending market, the, the money guys, they get real, real nervous uh, when those things happen. And of course, that's when you get all the negative headlines in the press and so forth. The good news is it hadn't lasted but we'll have to see how it's going. What you'll see is that despite all those stepwise increases in the Fed fund rate, the long-term rates have been coming down anyway, right? I mean, you can see the, the blue line is the 10-year treasury. The black line is the 30-year fixed mortgage rate for Freddie Mac uh, home loans. And, and both of those have been coming down. So what's, what is it that's making? Well, what it is is inflation. This is my spaghetti graph of the day. If you overlay inflation on top of it, you can see the markets are reaction, reacting to what they think price levels are going to do, what they're going to be in the future, and that has been holding rates down. And, and, and there's been simply no reason for rates to go up much. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably watch that. You can see there's a little hook there on the end of the red line where it looks like it bounced up. But what it did is it went from like 1.6 to 1.9%. So it was still under 2 uh, on the, and this is this overall CPI that I'm, I'm showing you on this graph. There's six, seven measures of inflation uh, that, the, that people use on that. Let me turn to Texas. Texas, uh, no, no surprise here. You know, it's always nice to give a history lesson every year because the history doesn't change unless I want to rewrite it. <laughs> you got to think about that one for a second. <laughs> But 2015, 2016, down years, the price of oil uh, dropped dramatically. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I like to point out to people that during that period of time, from, from right at the end of 2014 to more or less the end of 2015 for that period of time, the percentage change or drop in the price of oil and correspondingly the percentage drop in the active rig count in Texas was a greater drop than what we experienced back in the 80s, in the early 80s, which led to the depression of the second half of the 80s in the state. And that, that was an economic depression. It wasn't just a recession for our state and for most of our communities and states. So the, the interesting thing is this time around, we have a, an equally uh, dramatic drop in prices and rig activity even more so, but we didn't go into recession. We never even officially went into a recession, much less depression. It didn't even affect, for the most part, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth or Austin. I mean, both of those communities just, just flew right on through the downturn of 1516. Now, some of the other communities, particularly along the coast from Beaumont, Port Arthur, Houston, uh, Victoria, Corpus Christi, Obviously, Midland and Odessa got affected. But what's happened since then, Midland and Odessa right now are on the top of the list, of, especially Midland, of almost every economic analyst uh, uh, report of the last six months of the fastest growing community and the hottest market in the state, in the, in the country. Forget the state, in the country. And, and even Odessa, which is kind of uh, uh, drags a little bit behind Midland, is still way up. Uh, Midland has the highest median ha household income in the state. It, it, most people don't know. And Odessa is number five or six because you don't think of Odessa that way, but it, it is. It's a, it's a remarkable market uh, out there, what's going on right now uh, affecting uh, those markets. I was in Odessa about six months ago, 
this year, this calendar year, they started the year off 400 school teachers short in their school system. Now, can you imagine trying to run a school system when you're 400 teachers short? They went out and recruited and brought into the community 300 teachers from the Philippines. They are all living in their cars because they literally had no place to put them. They had no hotels, no apartments, no houses, no tents, no mobile homes, nothing. So they were literally, and I got that from the school superintendent, okay, when I was out there, it was described. So when, we, we, when you talk about, you know, having markets that expand, there's a thing about having good economic expansion, and then at some point it becomes a real problem, uh, you know, when you, when you have these things. 2017 recovery year, good year, 18 was better. Uh, here's the answer for this year, 19 will even be better than 18. It just won't be as big a percentage increase better. Whereas, you know, last year, or, or 18, you know, we increased 3 or 4%. Uh, actually, GDP was even better than that. Uh, it probably won't be uh, about two-thirds of that. Here's what we're looking for. Uh, 18 at, the, at GDP, probably end of the year. We, don't, we won't get into the year GDP numbers for another four months. Uh, that's government accounting. Just You have to put up with it. And then when they give it to you, then they change it. So, so you live with it. Uh, but it'll probably be somewhere in around the four and a half, five percent mark. Personal income's up about five, a little over five percent. That's the good news. That's that tight labor market's finally beginning to show up. Because you do think about it this way. If labor is tight, it's like anything else. Low supply, high demand, prices tend to go up. And if labor is in, in uh, low supply and the demand for labor is high, incomes somewhere down the line are going to start going up. And we are beginning to see wages and salaries start moving up. Oil prices were greater than $70 a, a barrel until the fourth quarter of last year. And again, that will show you. I got a graph anyway. I get, I get, to, I get to do it first. That, that's the only good news of this whole thing, that I get, to, I get to show it first. And then he'll tell you how I'm wrong. Uh, it dropped down there. And then what I just looked it up this morning before I came downstairs. It's like 66 bucks and some change uh, for West Texas. So it's, it's, it's been an interesting roller coaster ride here. Jobs have increased in the, in the state. We, we added over almost 280,000 jobs. Uh, we added almost 380,000 people just last year to the state population. Uh, by half of that, about 190,000 uh, were births over deaths. Uh, I think I've told you before, we're the third youngest state in the union. We're, our median age is 34.4 years of age. Uh, there's only two states in the union that have a lower median age, and we only have 12.3% of our population is 65 and older. And there's only two states in the union that have a, a smaller percentage of 65 and over. Same two states. Alaska. All eight people in Alaska are younger than everybody here. <laughs> and Utah. Think about it. <laughs> so they're a little bit younger. So we have this young population, fertile, active, but the birth rate really is low. The birth rate, particularly for the Anglo, uh, is less than replacement. And even among uh, Hispanic uh, population, which has historically had one of the higher birth rates, it has dramatically declined. That's one reason I'm going to show you some population projections where they've been revised downward is because the projected rate of increase on births of, of the Hispanic population in Texas, which is substantial, is actually lower because the birth rate's lower. But the really good news about the natural rate of increase in Texas's population, I am very happy to stand here and report to you, is the fact that the good guys are living longer. <laughs> OK? That's the reason the millennials hate us. They hate us. We, we not only have their jobs, we now have their houses. We ain't, sell, we ain't moving. That's the reason there's a housing shortage in the housing market and, and prices are going up, is that we ain't moving. OK? I got no reason to move. I got a 3% mortgage. My home value is going up. My property tax is frozen. And I spent 20 years getting rid of those people. Why would I want to move near them? 
<laughs> so, so we, you know, that, that's the good news. Now, the other part of it, though, is, of course, immigration. And most people aren't aware of it here in Texas, but actually, we immigrate more people from out of the country into Texas than we do from other states. Uh, it, and, and the numbers are there. If you, I, I can see you all trying to look and follow me on there. So it's, it's up there. We're, we're getting a lot of people from, uh, 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 per, percentage-wise, the immigration from south of the border, from the Mexico and Central America, as, as a percentage of total immigrants to the state, has been declining for almost a decade as a percent of total domestic, uh, I'm sorry, of total foreign immigration into the state. Of course, uh, well, I mean, no, we're building the wall on the wrong river. <laughs> right? I mean, it's amazing how Texans and Californians and Arizona understand this. We're building the wall <laughs> on the wrong damn river. If we build it on the Red River and the Pecos, we could keep out the Yankees and the Californians and we'd be all right. <laughs> but right now, we're cutting off our labor supply. Talking about the labor, you know, you know. So anyway, we do have people coming in. And of course, the domestic movement, we have people leaving, we have them coming in. But yeah, we're getting the most people from California, from Florida, from New Jersey, New York, uh, Illinois, and and, uh, and and we get the people from the other side of the Sabine River. I, I left out the Sabine. Uh, I was being polite. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll, we'll have to just see how that goes. The outlook, here, here's what we're looking for this year. The, the key for Texas's economy is, is, is a pretty easy key. As long as the U.S. economy doesn't collapse, we're in good shape. And even if the U.S. economy were to decline, go flat or even slightly negative, we're probably in good enough position with what we've got and the momentum that we've got going, we'd probably blow right on through it. Uh, the the 2007-8 Great Recession that we, we, we went through, uh, Texas, yes, we declined, our employment declined, GDP declined, but we bounced back. It was that V-shaped recovery that at the time people were talking about, if you, if you graph it and look at it as a graph, it goes sharply down and then it comes back up sharply. The rest of the country went through a U. It took years. In fact, some of the areas of the country are still struggling uh, to come back up out of the 07, 08. And it's 10 years, you know, almost, almost 11 years later since the start of the thing. And, and, but Texas came right back up pretty good. And we, we could probably be in pretty good shape with that. Employment's going to go up about 1.5% to 2%. Uh, after about 2.3% increase last year. So yeah, it'll be a little bit slower. Some of that's just arithmetic. As your base gets bigger, the percent increase gets smaller because you can't... Okay, I'm not teaching math here, but, but if you know the law of averages and the way averaging works out and, and percent rates of increase. GDP, energy sectors, uh, quite frankly, where our projections and our models that we've been running... <laughs> We, we assumed price of oil was going to be between $40 and $60 a barrel. Boy, we missed that so far. That's a big range. Actually, if we could have said $30 to $100, we'd have, we'd have been really happy uh, to be able to make our projections based on, on that kind of a prediction. And, and as, as I just mentioned a minute ago, right here the last few, few days, few weeks, it's been running north of 60 and it's now in the mid-60s. Um, I'm going to let Detlef really uh, address most of this, but, but our expectations are for economic forecasting is it is highly unlikely that the price of oil will, will ever get back up to that $80, $90, $100, despite a lot of the pressures around the world, unless something dramatic, something very dramatic uh, were to happen, a, a complete shutdown or, or a drastic reduction in supply coming from wherever, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, uh, 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 Kuwait, uh, Libya, whatever, and Libya is a, is a candidate now, uh, or Russia or something, but it would take a major uh, disruption to get the prices back up, mainly because uh, our fracking industry could, could, can increase production pretty quick and keep the, keep the prices kind of moderated a, a little bit. So we'll see. Population is going to continue to expand. We're going to add some more people, uh, whether we like it or not, and, and uh, that's becoming an issue in the state. One of the biggest issues in our state right now 
really is the fact of how do we, how do we account for and how do we accept and, and react to the economic and population prosperity that we've had the last decade. I mean, we've added almost 4 million people. I got a, car, I got a chart coming for you in a minute. About 4 million people to the state's economy in the last uh, 10 years or so. And, and the public sector never can keep pace when the private sector grows that fast. You just, you can't build roads fast enough. You can't build water and sewer treatment facilities. You can't buy, build streets fast enough. You can't build prisons fast enough. You can't do any of the things you got to do uh, when you have a, a population growth. Exports are doing well. Like I said, we're the second largest, uh, we're the number one exporting state in the country, doing well, contributing to the economy. Retail sales are, are doing. Here's the leading index from Dallas Fed. You guys can look this up just as well as I can on their website if you're interested in it. It's ticked back up. The downturn that you see there out there on the far end, that was when the price of oil uh, went down back in the fourth quarter uh, in, in November and December uh, before it started bouncing back up. There's a lag in there of about two months uh, before that uh, leading index uh, changes that much. Here's, here's my oil and gas slide. You've seen it before. The dark line is the rig count. Uh, it's gone up and down. It looks like a roller coaster. Uh, the other line, the, the orange line there, is the price of West Texas Intermediate uh, Crude. That's the Cushing price. Uh, that was a maroon line until it started going down and not changed it to orange. Okay. <laughs> if you buy that one, I got some partially waterfront rural land near Abilene. Okay. Uh, but what you can see is the, the rig count is basically going is leveling off. It's, it's, it's staying in that 500, 550. Uh, the price of oil has bounced back very well from the downturn uh, of the last, uh, uh, during uh, October, November, December. Uh, again, back up in the mid-60s. So we're, we're seeing this. The energy sector, we're, we're, our economic models right now are telling us that for at least the, the next six months or so, Energy is going to be more or less neutral in the state. It's neither a, it's not a driver, but it's not a deterrent. It's not, uh, I mean, it's, it's just sort of it's doing its normal thing and going on, despite the fact that weekly, daily, you get the ups and downs and so forth. Uh, we've got uh, all of these ducks being drilled, and I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Detlef tell you what a duck is, but, but if, the, if the market changes so much, i got to use the line. We get our ducks in a row. And, and, and start increasing or decreasing production uh, accordingly. And the other reason we think the prices are going to be relatively stable, we monitor the futures prices. In other words, if you were selling oil today for six month, one year, two year future delivery, is there any real difference in the price? And right now there's very, very, very little difference, uh, differential in those prices. So the, the futures market, the traders are telling us, based on that, that they're not expecting prices to go up or down that much to, to move. Actually, you can see the trend is kind of upward a little bit, uh, moving, that, m moving that direction. Our production is up. Uh, this is the price of oil, that dark line. The, 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 the red is the production level. And you can see how the, actually our production was declining until 2011. And then it, bang, it took off. This is uh, incidentally Texas production, which is up to about 4.8 million barrels a day. Uh, uh, U.S. production, and U.S. is now number one in the, in the world, is a little over 12. We produce in Texas about 40%, plus or minus, of all the oil production in the U.S. This comes out of Texas, and a lot of that, most of it, Permian. Which means that when we become independent country, When we become an independent country, we'll be the number sixth oil producer in the world. Now, that gives you a perspective of how important that is in the Texas uh, world and the Texas economy and so forth. That's the reason I, I do that. Here's the annual job growth. You can see it was about 2.3% last year. I mean, all you can see, you can see the bars just keep progressively getting taller. That's, that's what you really want to see. In terms of monthly change, the blue bars show you on a monthly basis how many jobs are being added. The red line is just a six-month moving average to kind of smooth it out a little bit because there's, there is a lot of uh, variability from month to month. That's the reason, incidentally, I would advise you 
Anytime you see monthly numbers on things like employment and stuff like that, don't get real excited one way or the other, either up or down, because one month it can be one thing and the next month it's totally different again and the next month after that it's something else again. It takes a while to see a trend really develop and, and see what's going. Here's that table I was telling you. In the last uh, really eight, nine years, uh, we've added right, na right at about four million people to the population of Texas. Uh, we've added 2.4 uh, million uh, jobs uh, in the state. And incidentally, that is a remarkable uh, ratio to add that many jobs relative per, on a per capita basis. Because generally you figure a job supports about three people, plus or minus, uh, in round numbers. So when it's two to one, uh, or one to two, whichever way you care to look at that ratio, uh, it, it's a remarkable uh, improvement in jobs and so forth. And now with incomes, that's, that's why prices, that's why your land prices are getting a little bit more. And that's why the housing prices are getting more. That's why rents are so high. We got all these young people. If the median age is 34.4 years, that means half the population of Texas is less than 34 years old. Well, if you're under 34 years old, you're likely to be, and you're more than 16 or 18, you are likely to be a renter rather than an owner. And that's the reason rents in the apartment market has been so strong the last five, six, seven, eight years. And rents are now getting to the point where, and in Texas, it's actually economically, uh, if you, if with the right circumstances, more uh, financially advisable to buy rather than to rent, uh, just based on the differential in the, in the cost there. Uh, major MSAs, you can see how Texas, uh, that's uh, Dallas is that blue line of how it's doing. Uh, the other metropolitan areas, Houston, San Antonio, Fort Worth, uh, following pretty much the state. Uh, you can see how Houston had the dip and is coming. That was the, that was the price decline in 15, 2015 on the, on the oil price and how it affected Houston's economy. But it is on the, on the rise. I have to tell you, you have to do Austin separate because the scale is so different. Austin has been off the charts, uh, and Austin is, is likely to stay a very high. Now, Austin, that's an Austin metropolitan area. It's a multi-county area uh, because so much of that growth and impact is going up into North Travis County, up into Williamson County, uh, even down into to, uh, to, uh, the, uh, 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 Hayes County. I, I have a senior moment every once in a while. You have to get, bear with me a little bit. So, so it, it's doing this, and, and in fact, I was in the Temple Belton area the other day and, and told them, Bell County's next. It's going right up that I-35 corridor uh, and, and the growth there. And it's down here in San Antonio. San Antonio's been a terrific market for the last eight, nine years, and it's been absolutely terrific. Job gain, population improvement, uh, the housing market here in San Antonio has been absolutely remarkable. Now, here's our projection at the center for the major metropolitan markets in Texas, uh, this, is, this is simply for job growth. The, the green bar is last year, is, is 2018. The blue bar is 2019, just so you can compare. And what you'll see is that just across the board, we're looking for positive growth, but just a little bit less than what it was last year uh, on the, I know you got black and white. That's, that's my cheating on you, okay? Uh, if you're looking at the black and white, it's the third bar over. It's the short bar uh, on most of them. So anyway, uh, state about 2%. Uh, Houston, a little bit about right at state average. San Antonio, about 1.4. Uh, Fort Worth at 2.2 and, and even, but Austin still about 2.5, 2.8. So we'll have to see. Austin, for example, you can see the, the uh, job growth here uh, going almost 3.5%, but slowing down to about 2.5%. Uh, the Dallas side of the Metroplex uh, growing about 1.8, right at about 2% uh, versus 2.3 uh, last year. Fort Worth still doing quite well, 2.2%. Some of the manufacturing is coming back to Fort Worth uh, that they lost a few years ago. Uh, also, Fort Worth's economy or, or, or industrial base is expanding a little bit more into uh, engineering, professional services, uh, non-manufacturing, non non-production uh, type employment, which is adding to its percentage uh, rate of growth. Houston is rebounding very well uh, from the from the uh, downturn in 16 and 17, when effectively it had no job growth. 
and then is bouncing uh, about uh, very nicely. Again, very diversified. It was interesting, even with the decline in the oil prices back in 15 and 16, Houston itself did not go into recession. It went flat, but it didn't go into recession in terms of job loss and growth. So Houston has diversified enough that while it is still uh, very heavily influenced by the energy market, by the price of oil and the rig activity, it's not as dominant a force as it was back in the 80s that caused it to decline. Now, it also helped that we didn't have 700 SNLs to have to go out of business. It also helped that we didn't have a change in the tax law in 1986 that basically cut out a third of all the value of all the commercial real estate in the United States. Uh, it would also didn't help you know, that, that we had a few other things like all the major banks going out of business because they, they couldn't diversify geographically. So now we have uh, more or less universal interstate banking uh, that, that keeps things more diversified with the banks. And of course, none of the banks today are retail banks anyway. They're, none of them are banks. They're all investment. They're all Wall Street uh, it, with just uh, until you get down to regional level size banks that are more retail, the traditional retail bank that we think of with deposits and so forth. I mean, I can tell you, Wells Fargo and Chase and all that, they don't really want your deposits. I mean, it's, it, that's a hassle. They have to keep track of them. And they even have to, they sort of pay interest. They don't really pay any interest anymore, which is another reason us <laughs> baby boomers don't like the banks anymore and why we're still working, you know. At zero interest rates, I can't afford to retire. You know, if they if they just give me some of the money, I'd quit tomorrow, and the millennial could have my job. Gary'd be very happy to give my job to a young person. Did he nod? <laughs> San Antonio, it, it, you can see how the job growth in San Antonio. And San Antonio's been one of those kind of. Uh, difficult markets to analyze and get a finger or get a get a real handle on because you, it, you you can't it's really hard to point to any one thing that's been in San Antonio but the whole market has expanded job market has expanded population has expanded obviously geographically it's expanded any other you came around I mean all of the road work I next year we may not have it here because we may not be able to get here uh, I don't know how you felt about it but coming in either 35 or 10 or coming around on 1604 to, to get here, that's a hassle. That's a ha and that's what I was talking about. When you have this kind of population expansion and growth, the public sector can't keep pace in terms of, the, I mean, this is stuff that if you knew it was coming, and I'm telling San Antonians, I'm telling people around the state, we're going to grow this at this pace again for the next 20, 30, 40, I'm fixing to show you. So you've got to be planning for it now, okay? All of the all the highway engineers were trained in the 50s and 60s when a two lane or four lane divided highway cured all problems. Does that cure all problems today? No. I mean, if you don't have at least eight lanes or nine lanes, you know, you 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 don't make it. But they it's hard to get, and of course you got to pay for it. That's 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 the real big one. Let me talk about Texas demographics real quick. The I-35 corridor going through, you can see that from 2010 to 17, don't have the 18 number yet, but by county. What's interesting, and a lot of people don't know it, is 91 counties in the state are losing population. And I know that a lot of you here in the room are from that area or those areas of the state in those counties because, of course, they tend to be our rural counties. Uh, Texas, incidentally, still has the largest rural population in the country, of any state in the country, just in sheer numbers. But you can see how the numbers are shifting, what is happening in, the, in those red counties that you see out there. The biggest problem they got is retention. How do, you keep the, how do you keep them down on the farm once they've seen Dallas? Or Houston, or Austin? Uh, it, it's that kind of an issue. They're, the Young people, and that's economic opportunity. I mean, if you're 28 years old and you're living to that, if you're not running the family farm or the family business, what do you do? What do you do? Well, so many of them are picking up and courts get getting an education and leaving to go get education, but then they stay gone. Now, some of them are getting ready for the next cash crop. <laughs> And some of them are getting way ahead of the curve on waiting for that next cash crop. But we'll, we'll see how that plays out. 
uh, as it comes along. I, I'm being told I'm running out of time. Okay, here's the projections. The red line was the original projection by the state demographer's office if we grew at the same rate as 2000, 2010. The green line in there, they revised the projection back in October and November of last year, and that you can see it lowered, and that was those birth rates I was talking about that influenced that the most. Uh, and then the State Water Board, Development Board uses that purple line. Now, that's important because of me. I know many of you come from areas of the state where water and what the State Water Board does and what the water plans are and how what water management looks like is going to be a big, big influence on just what happens in your local community. So, so you can see they're using even a, a lower projection, uh, projected population growth rate, at least the State Water Development Board is, uh, than others. Uh, so you, you, we, we're going to gain somewhere around 22 to 30 million people in the next 40 years versus 14 million the prior 40 years. That's a lot of folks. Okay, we're going to have to do it. Projected change by counties, you can still see some of the counties are going to lose population. It's still going to be concentrated in the urban triangle of Texas. The I-45, I-10, I-35 uh, corridor is filling in uh, very well. Uh, we're going to have to see. Here's Austin. You can see slight reduction down to about 4.5 million from the, about 1.7 in 2010, uh, about 2 million today. Dallas-Fort Worth is projected to go somewhere between 13 to 16 million people. I don't know what we're going to do with 16 or 15, 14, 15 million people up in D Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, but we'll have to see. The Dallas side of that is, is going to be somewhere around 10 million people. The Fort Worth side is going to be somewhere about 4 million people. Houston is going to be somewhere between 13 and 14 million from the current seven. I mean, we're talking doubling here. These are, these, everything, if you talk about doubling the population, just think of everything that exists in the state today, we got to double it. Every house, every apartment, every industrial property, every office building, if we stay the same proportion, everything has to double in the next 40 years. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> the nice thing about doing 40-year projections, I ain't going to be here 40 years from now. They have to come back and defend me. Okay. At least I'm not figuring on it. I, I don't think Gary will let me. San Antonio was the only one of the major MSAs where the actually the revised number was a little bit higher than the original number. Uh, but it, San Antonio going to about 4, 4.3, 4.5. Let me get to the housing market. 18 was a solid year. Sales, the rate of sales volume is declining. It was like 1.7% for the last year. It's going to be about 1.5% this year. And the reason is we just don't have enough houses turning over. Like I said, the, the good guys, the boomers, are not selling. We're not moving like we, everybody thought we would, so we're not giving up our properties. But, but everything here is good. Average medium prices are becoming a little less meaningful uh, because you have to start looking at individual price categories and so forth. Uh, uh, so those are changing. Price per square foot we find far more meaningful. Those are up 4 and 5%. Uh, we're running uh, state level about $125 a square foot. Someone was telling me here a little earlier this morning in parts of California, you're looking at $600 a foot for housing. And that's not unusual. New York, same way, San Francisco. You look at all of the major markets around the country, they're multiples higher per square foot on housing costs than what we are. Texas is still a very affordable state. Our major metropolitan, Dallas and Houston, our major metropolitan, Austin even, which is the highest in the state, is, and, and Midland, which is also high, are still very affordable by comparative uh, uh, basis to all of the other major areas and high growth areas of the, of the country. Uh, new home construction, Texas leads the world in new home construction. Uh, Dallas and Houston both built more single family homes last year than all but four states. Uh, so, I mean, it's been remarkable. And they'll tell you they could have built more, but they don't have the labor, they don't have the land, uh, the developed lots to be able to do it. That's the reason we're talking about the labor shortage and, the, and so on. Here's uh, the chart in your, in your book you can look at of what went on around last year. Uh, around Here's limited inventory uh, available. That's because we're simply not selling. We're not building enough homes. We're way, way short of homes and housing. Higher prices are affecting, of course, affordability. Our affordability by our historical standards is far less affordable in Texas than what we're used to seeing, but we are still far more affordable 
than co comparable other areas of the country. So affordability, you have to think in terms of context uh, when you talk about affordability. Interest rates are probably going to increase eventually. Uh, I thought it was going to be sooner than later. They, I've been wrong. Of course, anybody who predicts interest rates is a fool or a liar, take your pick. Uh, and, and so I thought interest rates were going to go up faster. They're not. Uh, this year, I think they're going to be more or less stable. <laughs> home, home rate, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, I don't think it'll get much more than about four and a quarter, four and three eighths, something on that order. And we'll just rock along. It's under four in some areas of the state. I, I get around enough to, to see that. I'm not sure how well this is showing up, but in March, you can see by metropolitan area, uh, sales were actually up. Most areas, the home prices are up. That's the one on the right. On a year-to-date basis, we're running about 3.4% on a year-to-date price, a median price increase, which is pretty good. Actually, that's a long-term average. We've reverted back to norm. Instead of going up 5, 6, 7%, between 3 and 4% every year is about what we average. And so that's, that's kind of an average rate of increase. Home prices, home sales per 1,000 households is a very remarkable number. We're selling, we are selling, though, houses fairly quickly. Uh, so it's, it's that way. Home price, the median home price. I know I'm going real fast. He's already telling me I've got to quit. <laughs> the affordable issue, home prices, that's the red line. Oh, You've got to look at the graph for this one. You can't see it in the black and white. The red line is median home price index to 1989 versus household income index to 89. As that spread gets bigger and bigger, affordability becomes harder and harder. It's real simple. Affordability is the relationship between income and home prices, how much down and how much a month. And, and once you figure that out, you can, you can track it. You can see we're running problem. We need to get uh, incomes up <coughs> and slow down that rate of increase. Housing inventory is still low. Uh, home inventory, particularly in the sweet spot, between 100 to $300,000 uh, uh, sweet spot, very tight inventory, less than three months. In Aggie speak, we ain't got none. We just don't got none. Uh, houses in that hundred to three hundred thousand, particularly new houses. Ask any home builder anywhere in the state right now: Are you building very many houses between a hundred and three hundred thousand dollars? And the answer is no. Not unless we can find 35, 30 foot lots, forty foot lots, uh, and do and stack and do the, some other things. And that's in the that's in the semi rural areas. That's not just downtown. That's, that's out in the surrounding counties that we're having to do that kind of density. We're still going to build more houses. It's going to be up about 3 or 4%. We'd build more, but we run out of developed land, lots and land. Uh, uh, regular, every regulatory agency is getting involved. We'll have to see how it goes. Multifamily permits, single-family permits, our leading indicator uh, is showing it going up. I don't have time to go. Th Here's our projection. If you want to see what our projections are for the housing market, for each of the metropolitan areas, bingo, you've got it uh, in your thing. Let me get real quick. Austin's going up. Permits are going up. Dallas-Fort Worth. The sales rate is going down in Dallas-Fort Worth because they just don't have any homes to sell. Dallas-Fort Worth is, is probably our most, most notorious market uh, for the housing shortage. But permits, the, they're, they're still trying to build as much as they can. Home sales in, in uh, San Antonio, in Houston, single-family permits. I know, you can see all this. Longer term outlook, this is my last. In conclusion, that's the best two words you ever heard from an economist. In conclusion, I, you know, our long term outlook, population is going to continue to grow. We're going to have continued issues with p keeping up. Infrastructure is going to be the name of the game for the next two decades. We are not going to be able to catch up our infrastructure. That's roads, water, sewer, uh, uh, schools, you name it. Infrastructure financing and the interest rate and the structure of financing and public financing is changing. Selling the bonds, being able to produce the bonds, getting voter approval for bonds. We've been interested to note how many counties and how many school districts the voters have actually voted down new bond issues that are desperately needed for the facilities, but they can't get the voters to approve the bonds being issued. And that's going to be interesting. Land, land resources, and government regular every government agency in the world from the federal down to HOAs is trying to get on the act of regulating land. Every regulation adds cost. Every law adds cost. Some of them are necessary. 
They're good. I'm not saying do away with them, but they all add an element of cost. And then, of course, money, 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 money. Uh, money, capital market flows, and so forth. And Charlie, I'm done. Thank you. Sorry. Well, thank you, Jim.